Welcome. This is Bleacher Blums, a sports podcast for baseball fans. Now here's Dave Tuttle and the Astros' master of banter, Blummer. Let's do it. Let's get back in the bleachers. And you know what is going to be awesome about this podcast is that I've changed the view. Tuttle's got his baseball cards back in the background. I've got, uh, that's a 1992 replica uh, regional championship trophy from the Golden Bears out there when we beat up on uh, the Florida uh, regional out there. So a little bit of nostalgia back there. And of course, product placement. If you want to go to bleacherblums.com and get your Bleacher Blums hat or t-shirt, feel free to go ahead and do that. Uh, We encourage it. Uh, I also want to tell everybody that, uh, you know, we are having a lot of fun doing this, but please subscribe, rate, review, get on there, give us some feedback, be kind about it. We'll be kind to you. Uh, We are on the social Nostra YouTube channel network that is seems to be going extremely well. People are subscribing to that. So I hope you enjoy it. And I've actually seen a couple of times where people have put us on the big screen, which is kind of cool. I never really thought of it that way. I always assumed that everybody would stream on their computer or on their device, but uh, there's people actually clever enough. And I discovered this last night with my daughters is that you can project it. uh, If you get the app on Apple TV for YouTube, you can do that. So that's been a lot of fun. We appreciate everybody. And of course, our podcast listeners are still doing an incredibly good job. That has been a lot of fun. And uh, what we've got on tap for today's show is brought to you by St. Arnold, our favorite brewery on this podcast, is that we are going to be specifically talking about the NFL. And we have got a guy that I have worked with, a guy who is an ex-NFL who played eight years in the NFL and is now working in the media. His name is Jeff Schwartz. And of course, what Tull has always wanted on this podcast is another G off. So Jeff Schwartz actually spells his name G-E-O-F-F. And I greatly appreciate that. We'll have him later in the show. But like I said, things have been going well. It's been interesting around the house, the Blum household here uh, over the last week, because a week ago, it was my birthday. Last, uh, last night, yesterday, whatever you want to call it, Uh, It was my triplets birthday. So my triplets just turned 15. We had a great day outside. And with some of the rules easing up around Texas here a little bit, we had some conversations with a couple of families that the girls are friends with. And yes, we had a, a, a pool party out back, but we didn't have too much interaction as far as inside the house. So we're trying to do our best to re engage, but it was great to see some of the kids. It's amazing how fast kids grow and how much they change. But uh, that's been my week, Tuttle. I know that's a lot of talking on my part, and people are probably thoroughly annoyed at me right now. So I'm going to let you have the floor for a little bit. It is very good to see your face again, man. And it looks Great. different. Yeah, what's different? Look at that. The razor is on the razor. Yeah. I hey, made the, uh, sipping from made the fountain the, of youth. That's right. You know, that's, that's actually the key to shaving it, I think, or the key, the, the key push to get me to shave it. Because you know how old I am, and most of the fans know how old I am. But uh, my daughter was like, you're starting to look really old. As the beard came in and got grayer and grayer, I'm like, you know what? You know, I'm not that vain, but I'm like, you know what? If my 10-year-old thinks I look old, then I might as well shave. And I got a lot more kisses and a lot more love as soon as I uh, as as I shaved off full gray beard there. So at least I know I can grow it. I guess my goal was to kind of make it through the end of quarantine and see if I could, you know, braid it or something like that. But uh, (laughs) I feel younger, I feel healthier, I feel more vibrant. And I think the uh, kind of what you were just talking about having uh, people over for the birthday party. And I think we've touched on this before in terms of how we're gonna get back into some sense of normalcy. Um, Definitely shaving was that uh, first step for me. And I do think that, you know, as the country starts to weigh the options of how sick can we get from this versus, you know, when are we gonna start getting back to normal and let businesses start making money and you know, kind of getting the economy uh, going again. I think that uh, I think that we're kind of on the horizon for that. And I hope that uh, I know Friday, last Friday, May 1st is uh, Texas had definitely uh, taken that first step in uh, freedom of choice kind of for the people. And, and I don't know, May Day happened on May 1st. You have, you know, Star Wars Day today, Cinco <laughs> de Mayo tomorrow. Yeah, kid birthdays yesterday. Like, man, how do you fit so much excitement and action into five days? This is like Hanukkah or Christmas, like vacation. I don't know. There's so many holidays. 
I know. And then we get, we're going right into next weekend is going to be Mother's Day. So don't forget that all you podcast listeners and all of you YouTubers right now, make sure you remember mom next week, next Sunday, May 10th will be Mother's Day. And speaking of the, just the women, womanly intuition or the woman's uh, the psyche, I think it's funny because your twins are both girls. But I think it's great the way that your daughter phrased how she felt about your beard. Instead of saying, you know, it's prickly and it hurts me when I give you a kiss, Daddy, you know, where you'd be kind of like, yeah, I'm sorry, but you know what? I'm keeping it. But when she comes at you and says, Dad, you're looking really old with that on. The first thing you do is probably like, wah, wah, yeah. get rid of that thing. How quick can I get rid of it? You know, my <laughs> wife's really good at that. And I think it's a version of sales, to be honest with you. But, you know, They've you always want people to. It. It's great. That's right. You want, you want this to be a free country, right? You want people to make their own decisions, right? So that's completely <laughs> my decision. But it was put on me and, you know, framed in a way that I really, you know, you gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, well just turned into something funny. That's outstanding. Uh, it's good to get this podcast started. It's also fun to uh, really have our first opportunity to have an interview on Bleacher Blums. I know in the past we've had James Click and that was a recorded interview, but this one is going to actually come at you. We recorded it just previously today, so I want you to enjoy some of the musings and thoughts of uh, our guest, Jeff Schwartz, who came on to talk about uh, NFL football and some NCAA football and Hey, he thinks uh, NCAA season is going to get off without a hitch. So without further ado, here we go. It's going to be Tuttle, myself, and Jeff Schwartz talking football. And here we go. We've got our episode of NFL Draft Input, and I have called upon another G-off in the world. And yes, it is Jeff Schwartz. You can reach him on Twitter at Jeff Schwartz, G-E-O-F-F. And uh, just a quick bio on Jeff and what he's done and why we have him on. We've worked together. We have the same agent. So it's kind of funny. When I reached out to my agent and I said, hey, uh, is there anybody within the organization that would be willing to come on our podcast and talk a little NFL draft for us? And immediately my agent, Debbie Spander, said, yes, Jeff Schwartz would be great. He'd love to do it. Obviously a hardworking guy now that he's retired from the NFL. But the funniest thing to me was is that the first two lines of a little mini bio that she gives me, of course, the first is an eight-year NFL offensive lineman, which I greatly appreciated. But immediately it goes to your brother. Your brother uh, played for the Kansas City Chiefs, all-pro yeah. tackle, Mitchell Schwartz, and that is what is in your bio, dude. Does that bother you at all? My bio, that, my bio that she sent to you? Yeah, she sent that to I actually, me. I actually, I, a real no joke, I have, I'm calling her after this anyways because I need to talk about some stuff. And I <laughs> stirred I, it up. And now I'm going to have to add this to the list of – you got to talk about it. no. I mean, look, if it helps me get on TV or radio, I don't really care. Whatever. I'm proud of my brother. He's obviously on the Chiefs. He's four time All Pro now. He won the Super Bowl this year. If that helps me get a couple media gigs and get get a job, I really don't care. So, um, but that's 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 hilarious. I wonder what they how many people they send that to. I got to seriously her. right. I got to ask. <laughs> but 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 to be fair, I don't know if Debbie is, is writing that or whether like someone someone underneath her just wrote all the bios for everybody. No, that's, that's a really good point. It could be just something that uh, maybe somebody working under an intern just went, oh man, Jeff Schwartz is the brother of Mitchell Schwartz who just won the Super Bowl. That's awesome. Yeah. And then fires it out there. But uh, I'm sure you are pretty uh, pretty proud of uh, Mitchell Schwartz going out there and winning the Super Bowl of Kansas City. But it kind of leads me into a question real quick. Now, do, is the Schwartz family gene on par with the Watt family gene in the NFL now? Well, I mean, not me. I mean, I was, I, I mean, I was never, hey, eight years or something. well, I played a while, but I was hurt and I was never an all pro wasn't a pro bowler. So I don't think that we're on the same track. I mean, my brother definitely is up there, but, but not me. I'm just, a, I'm a lowly, I'm like a, a little, a little worker bee. I was, I played oh. a bunch. I worked my butt off. I just, I kept getting hurt and, um, Nothing you really can do about that, but that's that's yeah. No, I wish we were we were up there, but um, I'll put uh, you up there. We're we're not at least not, I'm not pulling my weight. My brother's pulling his weight. I'm not pulling my weight on that. <laughs> hey, I would put you on par with Blum and myself. To be honest with you, Blum played uh, about 14, go. 15 years in the big leagues. I played ten years of minor league ball. You know, I didn't feel like I wasn't a professional, but man, I wasn't I wasn't pulling my weight. I wasn't to the par that he was. You know. Yeah. So if you average that, to, if you average that together. You had an eight-year eight, eight career. If you average my brother and I together, then we're like one of the Watt brothers. There you yeah, go. There you go. 
Hey, let me jump in with the Watt. I said one of JJ Watt's greatest tweets uh, was saying what his house would have looked like with the three brothers cleaning up before the NFL draft. And we don't have to get too much into the houses and the decorations of the homes. But he said his mom would have had them scrubbing that house up and down, top to bottom, before the NFL brought a camera in there for the draft. They just wanted to know if he had seen that tweet. That got me to crack up. Uh, no, I, I had not seen that tweet. But yeah, I mean, if, if we had done this at home, it would have been a lot different. I actually like the laid back look of the draft this year. I know they're not going to go back to that. Um, but I mean, if the choice was do this draft again or do it in Cleveland next year, I think I would choose to do this draft again. Um, I think that it was uh, personable. Uh, it made it seem like uh, Goodell had a heart a little bit. Um, we got, I think, more unique reactions from family members that were, you know, the, obviously the, the the genuine happiness, but it's different when you're in the, that green room and have a camera on you versus just sitting at home with your, we saw, unfortunately, some girlfriends get get get, uh, <laughs> get dragged by moms and, and significant others. Uh, and then look, we saw drunk Roger Goodell, which I was hoping we would get and we, we eventually did get and it was it was fantastic. Yeah, that was a bonus. I was kind of hoping uh, Tuttle and I had talked about this previously on a podcast saying we wish he would have shown up in a, you know, a Hugh Hefner smoking jacket oh, and, and maybe a couple of better product placement in the background. But it turned out pretty good. I agree with you. Uh, but to more on uh, Jeff Schwartz before we get into it, get back into that draft. He hosts a Sirius XM NFL radio show an ESPN r- weekly radio show on NFL Roundup. Uh, also host of Jeff Schwartz is Smarter Than You podcast. Uh, which is on the athletic and then an NFL contributor on uh, SB nation, which is awesome. And just to get into the draft, as long as you were talking about it, um, you thought the draft went o- overall extremely well. Roger Goodell did show a little bit of a heart, which was a lot of fun to watch, but uh, just your impressions of the draft, as far as who was the one winner and who was the one loser in this draft? Well, I think there were a couple of teams that did really well. And this is the year where there was just a lot of talent. So there were a lot of teams in the second round that got really, really good uh, value picks, right? I mean, look at Jalen Johnson out of Utah that went 50th overall to the Bears. It kind of easily could have gone in the top 20, right? I mean, this guy that that had the value that was there. I mean, the best drafts, I think the Ravens did a really good job. I think the Dolphins did a good job. Um, I mean, there's there's a ton of teams that did a great job. The one team I don't understand was the Packers and and drafting Jordan Love. I, I, it doesn't really, in my opinion, have any similarities to when, when Rodgers and, uh, was drafted when Favre was there. Look, Favre had said he was going to retire and one year left. Rodgers was considered a top, a top draft pick, fell to 24. Jordan Love was not considered a top draft pick. He was a fourth quarterback. Some people had him as a fifth or sixth best quarterback. Um, the salary of Aaron Rodgers was nothing like Brett Favre, right? I mean, to get out of this contract for another one or two years is a ridiculous cap hit. Is it really worth it? Uh, you know, the team just came off a 13 and three season and it feels like it would, 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 if I was in that locker room and we know the value placed on each pick, right? A first round, a second round, a third round, first round pick is obviously a supreme high value pick. And when you, when you draft someone like Jordan Love, you're telling all your veterans, Hey guys, we're not worried about winning now. We're worried about winning in two or three years. And that's going to piss off guys in the locker room because they just went 13 and three, went to NCAA game. And I understand that their 13, three was probably inflated a little bit. They were better than the numbers bear out but nonetheless they as a player you're thinking to yourself okay we're just two or three players away we're one wide receiver away from getting back we're doing the the jordan love pick does nothing to help guys there there now yeah it might help in 2022 but we know how the nfl rosters turn over by then so i I just don't understand and then not even that they drafted a running back in the second round and a, a basically a fullback in the third round in the deepest year of wide receivers. And so it just made no sense what they were doing. That, that's a great, I mean, that's, that's a great analysis. I, I didn't think about it from a value of that position of the pick, because what I, the question I was going to ask you was related to like in baseball, which we talk about a ton on our podcast, starting pitching is so valuable, right? So even teams with one frontline starter don't typically go that deep in the playoffs. But if you have one or two guys, Astros, for example, Verlander and Garrett Cole last year, the Dodgers, they go three deep. Um, you know, uh, basketball, you have LeBron James who goes to the right. finals every year for that quarterback position in general. So a little off the Jordan love thing, how valuable is that position in football related to those type of things? Because everybody continues to say, Oh, the quarterback's the most valuable position, maybe in all professional sports. You kind of touch on it by saying that was almost a wasted pick for the guys that are there. You'd mentioned it with your injuries um, in your career. I mean, how valuable is that quarterback 
for those franchises and um, you know, what impact can they have on an organization? Is it that, is it that, you know, huge? I guess? Yeah. Well, I would say that in, in football, um, the quarterback is so impactful uh, because of the way that we pass the ball now, right? It's a, it's a wide open offense. Now the quarterback has more on his plate and there's more involved with him helping you to win. You look around the NFL, no one has a chance to win unless they have an elite quarterback. And that's why I think it's the most important position in all of sports. You mentioned LeBron James, but yeah, LeBron can't win unless there's two or three other all-stars with him. I mean, a good quarterback can drag a bad team very far in the playoffs, to even give you an opportunity to get there, right? It's hard to even imagine an average quarterback getting a team to a Super Bowl, let, you know, let alone to an NFC Championship game or AFC Championship game. You know, in baseball, yes, you need to have depth, right? But it's like, you know, Clayton Kershaw has been in LA forever. They, they've, you know, they, they haven't won a, a World Series. They're going to win a World Series. I'm not a Dodger fan. Actually, I despise the Dodgers. I'm a Giants fan. So yeah, I, hope, I, I, I hope they never win a World Series. But, you know, they're going to win if they continue to build up the depth, right? Especially in their bullpen. And now, obviously, they have a zillion hitters and Mookie Betts. But, like, you know, they're not going to win because of one player. In the NFL, you can win. You know, the Chiefs are a great example because I was there with Alex Smith and so was my brother. Alex Smith was just good enough to get them to, into the playoffs, right? He was never good enough to elevate the team. Pat Mahomes comes in, almost the same exact team. You know, they added Frank Clark. They, they, you know, they, they added Honey Badger. I get that. But offensively, same roster as when Alex Smith was there. And boom, the offense just takes off. So I think it's the most valuable position in all of sports. Uh, but – when you have Aaron Rodgers there, do you really need to upgrade that position now? Do you need to do it now versus doing it in, in 2023, which is what they are planning on doing now? It feels like just a wasted pick because of the impact of a first rounder. First rounder plays right now. Like there's no, there's no like getting used to the NFL time now. You you draft him now, he plays. Well, now this guy's not playing for at least two more years. It feels like a waste. It's, it's some of the stuff that you talked about as far as the quarterback position being so huge. And I'm down here in Houston, and I've had the luxury of trying to transform myself into a Texans fan. But there are some issues uh, around the Texans that are kind of giving me some some pause. But one of the guys you're talking about, I think Deshaun Watson, Watson is one of those franchise quarterbacks that's been very good. And then you talked about there's a couple of things I want to hit on because you said the wide receiver position in the draft was very good. Obviously, some guys getting drafted that are very good. But at the same time, the Texans trade away their best weapon in uh, DeAndre Hopkins. And then you talk about clubhouse atmosphere or locker mm -hmm. room atmosphere in adding a Jordan Love and Green Bay. There is a lot of lot going on down here in Houston with Bill O'Brien being the acting GM and acting head coach, <laughs> trading away their best uh, wide receiver option, and then messing with the locker room, so to speak, by getting rid of that guy. Can you do me... Can you give me any semblance of what is happening down here in Texas or what the Bill O'Brien program yeah. process might be? So the reason why coaches don't make good general managers for the most part <laughs> is because you need to have, you need to be emotionless to be a general manager, right? You need to be able to make player transactions and, and acquisitions without emotion. So look, and Bill Belichick does that the best. Obviously he's a coach, but whenever someone gets close to being done, he gets rid of it, right? There's no emotion whatsoever in making that decision. And what coaches generally, you guys know this, they're, they, they have their emotion, right? Like they have a ton of emotion, right? They're always, they're up, down, up, down, just same as players, right? And even almost more than players, right? They, they, they just, there's, they're just, they can blow up and calm down, but they're, they're crazy. Okay. So now you have that type of emotional person in a position that requires no emotion whatsoever, just to, you know, just to be flatlined. So, you know, he trades DeAndre Hopkins because that's like the way he practices. Well, no, Brian, Grow up, Bill, because all wide receivers are divas. Like, grow up. Do you want to have a good wide receiver who shows up on Sunday? Or do you want to have a guy that sucks on Sunday but practices hard during the week? Of course, you want the guy that shows up on Sunday. So I think Bill O'Brien is just way too focused on how he feels inside and not worried about actual production on Sundays. And that's the problem I have with, with, with him being the GM is that it, he's too emotional for that position. I love it. That's a great answer. Yeah, you nailed it. I mean, you know, emotion is so funny. I mean, we talk about that in, in every sport, but I mean, you're supposed to not have any emotion. And I think you already touched on the fact that well, let's get to our fantasy best. football championship game. We said, nope, we're going by the numbers. We're not going with who we like. We're just picking positions and who we want. That's absolutely right. Now, uh, Jeff, you mentioned you went to Oregon. So uh, Justin Herbert, I'm here in SoCal. So the Chargers are uh, the topic of discussion. And Justin Herbert was obviously a high pick. Um, baseball, they look for comps everywhere. Um, you know, this guy looks like Mickey Mantle, you know, Mike Trout. Oh, this guy looks like this guy. And they kind of put comps in there. 
Um, I had a question because I saw a picture of Justin Herbert and Brady Quinn side by side, and someone was trying to tell me they look alike. That doesn't mean they look alike on the field. But um, for a comp for Justin Herbert, I think you watched quite a few games of his. Yeah. Um, what's your comp for him? And what's the, you know, what's the ceiling or the floor for the, uh, for the L.A. San Diego slash moving chargers? Why do you baseball guys still comp players from like the 50s? Like, I don't understand. I know. I just, I'm I don't with understand. you on that. I, I just don't get that. Like, so, I, yeah. like, so like oh, me, Mike I Trout is like, Mike I, Trout's a more athletic Babe Ruth. Well, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's 100 years ago. I hope he is. So we've touched on that, though. We've touched on that in our podcast because you have the analytics guys versus the old scouts. And if you sit into a stands next to a scout, no scout doesn't have gray hair. And every scout uses the guy that was like pre-1970. It doesn't make sense to me either. I think it's but, more like you know, who they just, wish they'll turn, in, turn out to be. Exactly. Or Ted Williams or somebody, the splendid Jesus. splinter. Well, he's not going to take some time <laughs> off to go fight, you know, in the war in World War II. Like, but, it's yeah, just, so, it's but one of my it's, favorite baseball because I'm a huge baseball guy. It's one of my favorite yeah. baseball things is like this nostalgia. And, and we're seeing it now a little bit with like, <laughs> we're seeing it now with like a little bit of the last dance with the Jordan documentary where people are like, oh, Jordan would average 55 points nowadays. Yeah. You know, Jordan, no one could ever play in the NBA. You know, LeBron could never play in the 80s. It's like, come on, guys, grow up. That's baseball's thing. Um, yeah. So Yeah, so that, that leads into the yeah. question. So who, yeah, who does Herbert comp out to so be I, in your uh, world, and how, how good is he going to be? Um, he, his body size, you know, and kind of the way he moves could remind me a little bit of Big Ben, a little bit just to the big arm. He moves better than, than Ben really moves, in my opinion. It's an oh. underrated part of what Herbert can do. Um, you know, Brady Quinn is not as tall. He's not sitting. Mean, Herbert's 6'6 six, six and 240. Yeah. It feels more like like Big Ben than does uh than Brady Quinn ever does. Um, you know, they're they're statistically the analytics will tell you that Brady Quinn and Herbert, I think, are similar in, in the way that their analytics had, had played out. But uh look, he's got a giant arm, he's very cerebral. He won the academic Heisman this year uh, at all college sports. Uh it was pretty impressive. Uh, but the thing you got to work on is anticipation of concern. But you have to hope that he gets in a more, um, you know, an offense that's built more to his strengths, which uh, Oregon really wasn't built in that way. And so he has a ton of upside. I feel like we've talked about him in a way where he can't get any better, where, you know, Herbert is just who he is. And yet Jordan Love can get better. And Tua can get better. And Burrow can get better. But Herbert's just already done. He's done as a prospect. And I just don't buy that. I really don't. So I think that, um, He'll be able to to come in and look. He, he gets he, he gets to first of all he gets to sit for probably at least eight weeks. I would imagine, especially with the short off season this year. You know, there's not going to be a, an offseason program, and maybe camp gets pushed back. I don't think so, but who who knows? Um, and then you have weapons. He's got an approved offensive line this off season. They have obviously Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, Hunter Henry, and Eckler. And they drafted uh, Joshua Kelly here from UCLA. So you know, he hasn't had a wide receiver drafted at Oregon the last two years. I mean, maybe the last three years, like there's, he hasn't had any, anyone to help him. So I'm excited for him in, uh, in, in LA. And, and last thing too, is, you know, LA is, I mean, the Chargers should say are like the 11th favorite team in Los Angeles. I went over this one day. I got to stop counting at 10. <laughs> it's true. I was just like, I was like, you know, I was like Dodgers, Lakers, Trojans, you know, like galaxy Kings, Kings angels, ducks. Like I just went through the list and I was like, Okay, now we're at at the at the Chargers. So um, there's just a lot of pressure on him. I think it's a perfect spot for him. That's not a bad idea. I kind of like the idea of not having pressure on him. And the way that you're making Herbert sound, it sounds like I'm going to have to turn myself back into a Charger fan after everything that's going uh, on down you know, here in Houston. You don't really have to, but, I mean, it's better than the Texans, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say, choice. it's a tough call, right? Yeah. <laughs> Toss it. Yep. But with the draft over, a lot of talk about the NCAA, and obviously Jeff Schwartz has had his opportunity at the University of Oregon to play in his college career. My question is, what are your thoughts? Uh, you already kind of gave us an idea of what the NFL might be working with a shortened uh, offseason for them. But do you believe with the way the NCAA and some of these schools are handling their this COVID situation, yeah. you know, some of these Division One schools – have already said that they're not going to have students on campus in fall. Do you believe that that's going to have an effect on uh, NCAA Division One football? Well, I think most have said they're going to have students, right, in the, in the fall, I think. I've heard a right couple. Now. I know it's like the Northeast schools have kind of said that yeah, they're going well, to back not, off. They, but well, Texas Tech and the Aggies down here yeah. have said that they're going for yeah, it. Or, Oregon has said they're going to have kids. And oh, today, yeah. even I believe Arkansas's athletic director told his board of trustees that they're, go, they're starting camp in July and they're playing September Great. 5th. That's good news. I, I, 
the, the thing that's going to be interesting to find out here with college football is I'm in the South. I live in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's not, it's a Northern South, but it's the South nonetheless. Um, the South, and this is going to sound crude. They don't care. They're going to no, play college football. I totally agree. Living, they're gonna, moving from California to Houston. Yeah. I agree with this 100%. They're, they're going to play college football. Yep. Whether or not the PAC 12 is part of college football this year, <laughs> I'm not quite sure they're going to play, but the South is going to play the big 10. It's probably going to play. The Big Twelve is going to play. Now the ACC doesn't really have many teams up in the up in the north. Uh, I mean the, the the northeast. I mean Rutgers and is really like the only Power Five. Syracuse kind of up there, but Syracuse is isolated from you know away from Manhattan, and you know and Rutgers is closer than any, anyone else really. But you know I just think that that the the issue becomes this. There's a couple of things. One is that obviously. Um, people want normal life to resume. So they want to have college sports back, but really there is a, a monetary issue here. College football brings in money that supports everything in your, in your school. I was told by one school, they could lose up to $50 million. If they play, but don't even have fans in the stands, they no play, st- but no, no fans. fans would lose 50 million. The thing with the fans is here's what, Holy. here's the thing with the fans, not like the NFL, the NFL doesn't need fans. The NFL has all their money from TV yep. and, is that, you know, when you are uh, when you have season tickets in the NFL in, in college football, I should say, you have to pay a booster fee typically to get those tickets, right? So like, there's, they don't give out like, hey, it's just, you know, season tickets w- without a booster fee, and those booster fees become expensive. They become a lot of money, and the concessions and, and the and the and the, and the, and the and the beer sales, like all this stuff adds up, and so there's a concern, in my opinion, with 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 finances. If you can't play college football this year. You're going to lose every Olympic sport in your school. You're going to lose some on the academic side. And I think that people are weighing this out. Now, again, whether or not this is the right way to do it or wrong way, I don't know. We still look, it's May 4th today. But, you know, training camp might not open until July 30th. So we have plenty of time to figure it out. But there's a point, I think, that comes where colleges say, look, I, I understand that, that there's a risk come the fall again with, with COVID showing back up. But we got to make money. Like we, 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 and, and maybe that's a problem with the way everything's tied together with, with money and, and college sports. But there was a point where I just don't think they care. They're going to say, look, we understand that there's a risk. If you're over 60, you're over 70, don't come to the games. Everyone else, you can come, like, I, whatever it is. Right. But like, I think they get yeah. to a point where there's just the care factor. We're already seeing it now in society, right? Like there's a, like a lot of places are like, look, I, I just can't do it anymore. I've been inside for, for, for six weeks I can't do it. And these people are going out on their own or states are opening up, whatever it is, the level of, of care has gone slowly down in my opinion. So I think that's going to run into college football season. Oh, I completely agree. Uh, yeah. My first thought when the whole football thing was going down and with major league baseball, all these major sports and how they're talking about it. The reason there is so much talk is because these are billion dollar industries. And when, you, you know, small businesses, unfortunately are going to maybe hurt or fall by the wayside, but these major industries that are making nine, 10 billion plus dollars a year, they're going to find a way to keep them going and find a way to create that right. revenue stream, especially for some of these schools. But I had no idea it'd be a $50 million loss yeah. if there wasn't a fan in the stands. But talking about some of these schools in the South, and now you live in North Carolina, I'm down here in Texas. So this is definitely football country. And when you were, you were in, uh, when were you at Oregon? Early 2000s? Oh, sorry, oh, oh, 04 to 07. Okay, so you were there in the early 2000s. There were still competitive, highly competitive Pac-12 football going yeah. on. I was a decade earlier. We won't bring that up again, but... Um, what happened to the Pac-12? Why are they, they – they continue to get good talent drafted out of the Pac-12, but as far as a power conference, it seems that like they've fallen to the wayside a little bit. Yeah, well, a couple of things. One, USC is just not good. And, and unfortunately, USC, as much as I don't like USC, they have to be good, right? I mean, they're, you know, you know, they're the, you know it would be the same if, you know, if, if Alabama wasn't good in the SEC – I mean, you need to have, you know, if Texas, Oklahoma, I mean, Oklahoma's carrying the conference right now in, in, in the Big 12. If Ohio State wasn't good in the Big 10, right, there'd be problems. And so I think that's a concern. Secondly, um, I, we're seeing people migrate out of California now because it's too expensive to live there. So you're losing some of these high school talent that would have stayed in California is now leaving. They're going to Nevada. They're going to Texas. They're getting out of the state. It's too expensive to raise a family in California. And third – is along the same lines now, we don't have big bodies. Look at the draft this year. 
all the big bodies come from the south and 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 the north and the the midwest like this is not big bodies in college anymore. now Mario Cristobal at Oregon is doing that. He's bringing big bodies back. They're coming back to Oregon. Nice. They're, they're, you know, they're trying to get it back. USC's trying to – they're recruiting right now a little better for next season. But I say we don't have the bodies. We don't have the talent to compete at that level. Now, I'm telling you, Mario Cristobal at Oregon, he knows what's going on. Like He is a guy who is on it. He's a guy that loves recruiting, that knows what to do. And so I trust him to get things back. And they had two top ten recruiting classes now. Uh, he gets it. He gets got, get it bigger and stronger in in the line. So that that's I think three, those three things are are a concern of mine. Uh, but the Pac-12 was was better last year, and I hope to continue that. But we look, we still have Olympic sports. We're doing great in baseball and softball and gymnastics, and you know those are not um, money makers for the conference. Uh, you know, Oregon probably had a great shot to win the women's basketball title this year. I mean, you know, those are great. But I do think, lastly, on this, I'll end with this one here with with this topic is that. I think the Pac-12 uh, worries too much about being great in every sport and not worry about the the the, the top two sports. I, f- I feel like the SEC, for example, they put all their time and resources into winning in football and basketball. The Pac-12 Conference of Champions, I get it. It's great that we are great at baseball and softball and, and women's gymnastics and rowing and all this stuff, and it's great. But that doesn't actually make us money. It doesn't yeah, actually money. help us in football and basketball. Great point. Well, I, re- I read an article many years ago. It was really funny. No matter what USC and UCLA do, USC is a football school and UCLA is a basketball school, and you can't switch the two. If you're a great football player and you're going to play in LA, you're going to go to USC regardless. And yeah. I think to your point, um, they focus on those sports. Uh, I, I saw an article with college football and basketball. If they don't play this season, you mentioned the $50 million loss if they don't even have uh, fans in the stand. If those two sports, college football and basketball, don't play this year, then every single uh, ac- uh, athletic program is in the red now. Nothing's yeah. running in the black. It's all upside down, and it's all it's all you know struggling for money. And that's why I think that it's at some point people are going to say, "Look, the risks are the risks. We we know what they are as a society. Uh, it's up to you to choose whether you want to come to a game or not." Obviously, there's the liability questions become a big factor in this because yeah. you know, we, we we've seen cruise lines get sued. But I think it's going to be hard to pinpoint. You know, that I got I got sick at X Stadium. I feel like that's going to be hard to actually pinpoint. Um, but I think that's what they're working on now. If if I were them, I'd if I'd be working on the the, the liability stuff. If, if, you know, what, what's my liability here if someone gets sick in my stadium? All right, that is going to do it with us and Jeff Schwartz. Uh, appreciate everything you've yeah. brought to our show. Uh, this you are actually the first actual live interviewee on our podcast we really appreciate it man you did a great job thank you man glad glad to be the first yeah is there anything that i need to plug or you want to plug before we get off this thing uh no just my podcast that was great yeah appreciate you doing that jeff why don't you take care man be safe all right take care guys have a great one thanks jeff take care bud That was great stuff. Thank you very much to Jeff Schwartz. And again, if you want to follow him on Twitter, he's a phenomenal follow. He doesn't just give you great NFL analysis and some sound bites. He's a very good family man. He's got some interesting stuff. He actually broke out. He threw a fart joke out there the other day that I couldn't stop laughing at, probably because I can relate to it. But he's a good (laughs) overall dude. And believe it or not, uh, you know, he, he likes to uh, watch a lot of baseball. He's got some great baseball insights. So who knows once the season starts, maybe we can start asking him about that, but, uh, a great conversation with Jeff Schwartz. If you want to follow him on Twitter, which I, like I said, I highly recommend it's at Jeff Schwartz and it's G E O F F S C H W A R T Z, but a great conversation. Some interesting points have been brought up and I want to bring Tuttle in real quick and say, Hey, what did you take away or what do you feel was one of the more uh, more great points that he brought out during that interview? Because there was a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah, so much good stuff. I mean, it's funny because we're on here talking about baseball all the time and we kind of, I don't know if we're deemed experts, but we certainly provide some insight and analysis. And obviously Jeff has a lot of uh, the same kind of knowledge when it comes to the inner workings of the NFL. The part that I thought he mentioned um, or that I liked that he mentioned was the fact that the South don't care is kind of how he put it, right? I mean, you mentioned being in Texas, but he mentioned being in Charlotte. Charlotte's the, you know, semi-South, meaning you're not South of the Mason-Dixon line and you don't get sweet tea when you go to the restaurant, but, you know, you'll probably get regular iced tea and have to sweeten it. But, uh, you know, North Carolina is definitely included in the South from uh, from our perspective. And he's just saying, 
you know, they feel like they're going to lose too much money. And it's that risk reward analysis. We continue to talk about it. I mean, who's at risk? How many people will die? What's the liability? Who cares? Let's put 50,000 people in a stadium and let's get the, you know, let's get the, you know, the show on the road because I think that ultimately money talks. We've said that before in every one of these kind of situations. Nobody cares that the if the Mariners cheated or the Orioles cheated because they didn't win. They didn't they didn't get any accolades from it. But we do care when the winners cheat. We care if the Astros or the Dodgers or the Red Sox somewhat Major League Baseball cares that the Red Sox cheated. Yeah. But but ultimately we want to watch college football. I mean, D- Davo Sweeney had said it a couple of weeks ago. We're playing the season. I mean, they're going to have a lot of uh, leverage. And I just thought that Schwartzy brought that up and uh, was really valid, which is, you know, they're going to they're gonna play football like they don't care. And, yeah. you know, they have a different kind of mentality. This is a free country and free rights. And there's a lot of other political views there that kind of maybe uh, flow over. But that was I thought that was um insightful and probably fairly accurate. I think we're probably going to have a college football season, especially in in those areas. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, there was some great insight into that. And, uh, you know, the the interesting point about the Pac-12 because of the cost of living out in California affecting who goes there or who moves out of there. Uh, At the same time, you know, I thought it was a a great conversation that he had about uh, Jordan Love being drafted by the Packers you don't typically think is that of that organization is having some issues in a draft or uh, organizationally, but it seems like they're in limbo right now with that draft pick, maybe pushing their future to 2022, 23 with that pick. And then it was also interesting to hear him talk about the Texans, of course, because we're all trying to understand what the hell's going on down here in Houston with their football, uh, football organization and I love the fact that he said GMs cannot have their emotion in it. Uh, obviously, you've got to bring up the, the New England Patriots. They take a lot of the emotion out of it and get rid of guys. And I kind of relate that to the St. Louis Cardinals when they got rid of uh, Albert Pujols. That's a guy who ingrained himself and bled Cardinal Red. But at the same time, they said, you know what? We're at a point in an organization where we don't need this anymore. We can't handle it anymore. We're going to move on. And I think that's where some of those successful organizations go is where they take that emotion out of it. And he's right about some of these head coaches or managers that we've had in the past. Man, they can get hot headed. They can be a loose cannon every once in a while, just like some of the players. So I appreciate his insight on that. It was great having him on. But uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Bleacher Blums. We hope you enjoyed it. Let us know your uh, feedback again. You can uh, check us out on iTunes if you're in the listening capacity of podcast world and uh, subscribe, rate, review on that, and then go to the Social Nostra uh, YouTube channel and get on there and subscribe too. A lot of other people within our network are doing a great job with their podcast, giving you plenty of information from all over the spectrum. Obviously, we're a little more uh, sports oriented, and now we might be part-time NFL analysts now that we've gotten some great information, but We're going to take off for now, so the tickets uh, are going to be uh, taken and cashed in because the bleachers are closing right now. Tuttle, what do you got going away, man? Yeah, so again, always a shout out to first responders, healthcare workers now, everybody. I'm I'm hoping they, you know, I think we've said this for the last four or five podcasts. I'm hoping to get out into the real world here eventually. Uh, The cabin fever is just getting uh, off. Yeah, that's right. I got to show off the clean shaven face. But, uh, you know, the cabin fever is pushing the... uh, pushing the envelope in the uh, Tuttle house and probably all around the neighborhood. But I think that, uh, you know, I mean, a shout out to all the, like I said, the first responders, healthcare workers, people that are out there still on the front lines dealing with this. Um, You know, we're kind of not, we're not, we're not at the end of it yet, but I think we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, you know, Jeff, always good to be with you in the bleachers. I thought the interview went great and uh, I'll look forward to catching up with you uh, here shortly. Yes, you will be catching up with me here shortly, and I'll tell you everybody why and how we're going to do that, because we're trying to mix up a little bit of the format, come at you a little bit uh, more frequently now that we have the time and we're getting a better game plan. But to Tuttle's point about thanking all the first responders and everybody out there, I've got a special shout out that I promised to a young lady who was on my Twitter account and actually sent me a photo of her. And she had the Astros face mask, she had the Astro hat. And immediately I thought to what Tuttle and I are constantly ending every podcast with is everything that we appreciate, uh, everybody in the military, frontline, healthcare providers, and people like that that are out there putting, uh, you know, putting risk above reward for our benefit. And Stephanie Curta is one of them. She uh, says, Stephanie Curta, I asked her for her credentials. She gave me LVN. 
and it says materials manager and scrub nurse at Memorial Hermann Surgery Center in Conroe. So that is our shout out for this week, Stephanie Curta. I appreciate that. And what was great about this is that all of a sudden it led to a thread of about six or seven other photos of police uh, police officers out there doing a job, some doctors, some more scrubs, and everybody with their Astro gear on. So I greatly appreciate that and everything they're doing. And uh, her Twitter handle is at Curta S if you want to go check out some of those photos, but it's been a great show. I agree with Tuttle. It was great to have the interview. We're starting to broaden our horizons a little bit and bring some insight into you and give you as much as we can. But that is going to do it for us in the bleachers. So as we finish, we always tell you, get after it. But most of all, believe it. <laughs>